Journalist and author Michael Pollan is probably best known for his books Cooked, Food Rules, and In Defense of Food. And the science of eating has always been standard fare. But in his latest book, he takes on the science behind mushrooms and other edibles of a very different variety, hallucinogens, and their many benefits. The book is How to Change Your Mind with the New Science of Psychedelics. teaches us about consciousness, dying, addiction, depression, and transcendence. Michael Pollan joined me recently to talk about it all. Michael, good to see you. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Jim. So what caused the transition from omnivore's dilemma to, I don't know, tripper's dilemma, for lack of a, <laughs> a better expression? What happened? Well, food for me, I mean, was a subject I was interested in, but it was part of a larger interest, which is in our engagement with the natural world. And these things from nature we take into our bodies represents our most profound, the most profound way we affect nature. One of the things we do with nature is use psychoactive plants and fungi to change our consciousness. And I've always been curious about what is that about and so that's something I followed for many years touched on in earlier books and then when I started hearing about this research that they were actually giving psilocybin the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, magic mushrooms yeah. to people struggling with anxiety and depression people with terminal diagnoses I became really curious to understand what was going on and practical applications not only for people who are dying and dealing with that for alcoholism yeah, addiction uh, is very addiction, important cigarettes yeah. that sort of thing you know most of us here think the history of psychedelics begins and ends about a mile away yeah. across the river with Timothy, Timothy Leary. Leary and turn on tune in and drop out there's more to it. one of the things I know this is speculative you suggest that some believe that maybe even belief in a god may have come yeah on a trip. Where does that come from? Well, there's, there are a lot of people who theorize. I mean, how do you, how does a people come up with the idea of a beyond? That there's another world, an underworld or a heaven? You know, where do you get that idea? Well, one place you would get it is with psychoactive uh, plants, drugs. And we do know that traditional cultures have used them, you know, thousands of years before Timothy Leary. The, the ancient Greeks had a, uh, had a psychedelic. We don't know what it was. They called it the Kikion. And once a year, everyone in Greek society went through this ritual and saw, visited the underworld and, and talked to the dead. And uh, you, were only able, you were only allowed to use it at that ritual and no other time. Um, and, you know, many traditional cultures have had this drug and it's been a sacrament. Uh, in the, the Mexican Indians had uh, some uh, sacrament mushrooms that they called the flesh of the gods, just, just as Christians do. So let's return to Tim Timothy Leary times and talk about a tale of two politicians. Uh, I think everybody watching remembers Richard Nixon in 71 saying the most dangerous man in America yeah. is Timothy Leary. I knew nothing about Robert Kennedy. We're about to celebrate, uh, commemorate the 50th yeah. anniversary of his assassination in a couple of weeks. Kennedy had a totally different take on this, yes? Yeah. Robert Kennedy actually, when, when the, the culture was turning against psychedelics and the political establishment was trying to ban them, because remember, they were legal till the late 60s, mm -hmm. um, Kennedy uh, spoke up in Congress saying, why were these valuable medicines last week and now they're evil? Um, and there was a personal connection. Yes, it wasn't abstract. What was that? Because Ethel Kennedy had apparently been treated successfully for depression with LSD. And so he had first-hand knowledge of the fact that this was actually a therapeutic drug, or could be, used in the right setting. And he tried to, to you know, hold back this wave of moral disapproval, but failed. Why uh, did uh, Richard Nixon think uh, Leary was the most dangerous man in America? What did he, what did he f well, fear, for lack of a better expression? And obviously he was not alone in, in no. that regard. What, what was the concern? The counterculture was very threatening to Richard Nixon. Um, these were his enemies. And, and propelled in part... By, by LSD, yeah, he saw he saw LSD as the kind of neurochemical infrastructure of the counterculture. And Leary had actually said, "Kids who take LSD are not going to fight your wars." And he wasn't making that up. But there was some truth to it. There was people would question authority after they used LSD. So Nixon understood, and in fact, the drug war uh, it's subsequently come out. Uh, Ehrlichman gave an interview recently where he said that the drug war was about going after blacks and hippies. And that was a tool to get at both of those. Uh, so people. that's when it went from front pages to back alleys, for lack of a better yeah, expression. It went during. underground. It was forced underground. Now, you are the reverse of almost everybody in your generation. Almost everybody of the same age uh, dabbled a bit in psychedelics, including I yours truly. I was too terrified. Too terrified. And don't do it as adults because we are too terrified now. Yeah. You didn't do it then, but you weren't too terrified. Well, I was terrified still. But you um, did it anyway. But there's a way to do it now that, that for an adult is kind of more appealing. What does I that mean? mean? 
Well, you can have a guided journey with someone who really knows the territory and can help you and create a safe space in which to do it. I think that, you know, we become control freaks as we get older. And the idea of surrendering control to this weird mental experience is, is, is terrifying. Or what was the be. weird mental experience like for you, to use your words? Well, it was very profound. I had several of them in the course of, of researching the book, um, but I had one in particular where I felt my sense of self or my ego completely dissolve until I looked out and, and I saw it painted over the landscape. I, was, I became a coat of paint, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> and yet I was okay with it. I was absolutely fine with it. And, and, and there was another eye that was taking in this thing, another consciousness that was unperturbed. And I realized, oh, I'm not identical to my ego. I can actually turn off that chattering neurotic in my head. And, and that's proved to be very useful. You know, you mentioned at the top of this discussion, Michael, uh, uh, the value, potential value, but actual value in some cases, for people who are confronting death. You told us a story on the radio about uh, a man who became a friend. I think it was at MSNBC. Was yeah, was? yeah. Tell us about him, if you don't mind. Patrick Metis was a journalist. I actually never met him. Uh, he was my age, oh. and he was a journalist at... Uh, MSNBC, and he had bile duct cancer uh, that had spread to his lungs, and he didn't have very long to live. And he was in uh, the kind of existential panic that people get into then. And he entered a, a trial at NYU where he was given psilocybin in a guided situation, mm -hmm. a very safe situation, and he had this extraordinary journey in which, among many other things, he, uh, he climbed this precipice and looked over it, and he saw this this plane of consciousness that he realized was where he would go when he died. And it, and it was okay. And he sort of, I mean, it was that perspective I think I had in mm. some sense, this, imp, you know, this untroubled, unburdened perspective. And he said, I'm not ready to go now. He, he felt like he could go now, but he, ha he still had a lot to do, and he loved his wife and wasn't ready to leave her. And he turned back and made the best of his last 17 months uh, and, and had actually a very... Um, happy period. People in the hospital, they would gravitate to his room because of the, the love he was putting out, this glow that he had. And uh, he, he died um, with, a, with a sense of peace that you know, anyone would envy. And it's not just confronting death. Examples here of people who were able to deal with alcoholism when they couldn't yeah. before. Cigarette addiction, one trip yeah. and over. That, is, that was most stunning. I talked to people and I tried to understand, why would a single psilocybin uh, trip do this to you? And they would tell me things that seemed like so implausible. They would say, like, well, I, I grew wings and I, and I went through uh, world history and I witnessed all these scenes and I died three times and I saw my body on the Ganges. And I realized there was so much to do in the world, and it's so wonderful that killing yourself with cigarettes seemed really stupid. Now, we all know that, but for some, there's something about the psychedelic experience that makes that idea this deeply held conviction that you can then act on. Are you worried that people are going to watch the legendary Michael Pollan and think he's lost his marbles? I'm serious. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. Are you, do you think about that at all? I worry more that lots of people take these drugs recklessly. I mean, that, you know, careless use, they, they're very powerful and people can get into psychological trouble. In a time when there still is an attorney general contemplating prosecuting people yeah. for uh, complying with state laws on oh, recreational marijuana. and even medical marijuana, yeah. what hope do you have that this book opens eyes to the point where there at least is some investigation of the health value. Because it, it appears, based on peer-reviewed research we have now, that these drugs have the potential to help people we have very few tools to help. Depressives, antidepressants aren't mm -hmm. working very well anymore. People don't like mm -hmm. taking them. Uh, addiction is a huge problem. Uh, rates of suicide are climbing. We have people with PTSD, and we don't have a lot of tools. Here is something that, that researchers think could actually be a revolution in mental health care. Um, so, you know, I, it's not about politics. Yeah, we might find a, another backlash. I think people have to be really careful. I think another Timothy Leary coming along now and just being an evangelist saying everybody should use these drugs, you know, um, could start a backlash. But um, so far, all the researchers are being really careful and, and, and sober about the whole thing. Well, speaking of Leary, at minimum, people should tune in. It's a great book. Congratulations. Hey, thank you, Jim. Thanks so much, Michael Pollan. The book, again, is How to Change Your Mind, What the New Science of Psychedelics Teaches Us About Consciousness, Dying, Addiction, Depression, and Transcendence.